And finally, Season 2 of Boku no Hero Academia has come to an end. But thankfully, we're not going to have to wait too long, because Season 3 was greenlit, it was announced, it was announced at the end of this episode, it was announced in the latest chapter of the manga, and so it's really nice to see that we're not going to be waiting for like years to come for a possibility of a season 3. I mean, it was a given that we were going to get a season 3 just because of the popularity of Boku no Hero Academia, but it's really nice to see that it was just announced so quickly, so soon, and it, it makes sense, because, I mean, not just the popularity of this series, but there is a lot more content to make another season of Boku no Hero Academia, so I think it would be a good time to actually do it, especially for the content that is going to happen in Season 3, and I want to say right now, anime onlys, you're not ready. Like, if you like this season, like, if you like this season of Boku no Hero Academia, I'll tell you right now, okay? This was some baby stuff compared to what is going to happen in the first half of Season 3. I I'm just going to say right now. Like, the equivalent to the next arc, what's going to really be about and all that, I'm going to say right now, that's like the equivalent of like maybe the Marine Ford arc of One Piece. Like, that's like that crazy arc you see in a Shonen and all that. That's basically what's going to happen. And I want to say right now, you guys are not ready for all the reveals, the, the info dumps, the world building, characterization, and development. You're, you're just not ready. You're, you're not ready for that Season 3 because it is going to be insane. Right, that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to go any further than that. I'm just saying... It's going to be a really good season. I mean, if I look at the track record of Season 1 and Season 2, I can already expect Season 3 to just be mind-blowing. It's just going to blow up my mind just because of how good it's probably going to be. But anyways, though, the finale is here. And even though we know a Season 3 is going to happen, we still are going to have to wait for a good while. There's no release date, like when it's going to come back. For what I'm aware of. I, I don't know if a date has been given. If it has, correct me in the comments below. But at this time, though, me making this video, I am unaware if there was actually a release date. So if I had to speculate when we would probably get a Season 3, I would probably say it would come out maybe spring of anime 2017. That's what I would say. Spring or, or summer. Very similar to how Boku no Hero Academia started off. You know, Season 2, how it started off in spring. I could definitely see... You know, Season 3 starting off in spring next year. I, I could definitely see something like that happening. I mean, it would make a lot of sense. I mean, you would have a, a two, like a break, like two season break. You would have a fall break, fall 2017, and then you would have winter 2018. And that would give them enough time to really prep and work on Boku no Hero Academia Season 3. Because as we know, Season 2 was like really far into production before it even started. Like, they were way ahead of schedule. So, when you look at it like that, I'm willing to bet they're probably going to get another early start to the series. And that's... Probably why it might start off in spring or summer of next year. So anyways, we're going to have a long wait, but it's better, you know, to wait than never to have a season, if you want me to be honest. I mean, there's a lot of series that I've seen over the years that have never gotten a season three, and I would love them to have a season three, but they'll probably never get them. So I'm glad to see Boku no Hero is getting that content. Okay, so since this is the final episode, this is the final anime review I'm going to be doing for a while. And... I think for a finale for Season 2, this is definitely one of the best ways to end off the season. It, it's not just the fact of how good it was, it was because of the message of the finale had so much weight to it, because when you look back at everything that has happened throughout Season 2 and even Season 1, all of that reflects onto this episode. You see so much when you think about, like, Holy crap, like, this episode is really showing how much has changed since the beginning of the series, and the tone of this episode preps us for season three. Like, let me explain, okay? If you think the tone of this episode was very dark and, like, whoa, like, it just blew up your mind because of how good it was, this, like I said, sets the tone up for season three. That That's exactly what's gonna happen. Like, if you like this tone here in this episode, expect more of that in season three. It's gonna be, like I said, insane. So, I feel like the setting of the episode, just the way it felt overall, it was perfect for what was to come in the future. And I think this was the best way to stop this series, especially at the scene where Shigaraki gets his conviction what he wants. And it, it really is fitting when you think about what the, you know, season two has been about. When you look at the first half, it was about Stain. Him kind of exposing the system, the hero system, exposing everything about heroes, exposing, you know, how there's many villains and heroes out there that are just not proper heroes and villains. For instance, heroes, they're not really heroes just because they get a license. I'm not going to get into too many details of that because 
because I discussed that many times in the past, but you also have it to where villains, they have no conviction. They just do things just to do things. Like, for instance, you know those, like, uh, one-dimensional villains you see in shows or literature or whatever that just destroy to destroy, they have no reason for it? Well, that's what he was basically talking about. He's like, there's too many villains and there's too many heroes that just don't have any motive or reason to be what they are, and that's kind of how villains were. They just didn't have any conviction or whatever to do what they're doing. And, for instance, when Stain says you don't just kill someone if you don't have conviction, you gotta have a reason for why you do it. You need to have a reason for why you do these things. And I, I agree with that. I mean, when you think about it, all great villains when you see these great villains in the literature when you like them usually it's because you can understand them or they're very fascinating because of the way their conviction or the ideology is and that's what made Stain very interesting it wasn't the fact that he was right it was the fact that the way he went after what he wanted and he didn't give up and he had this conviction to try to go after it was very it, it was inspiring it, it was very inspiring for many and that's kind of what stain did he is like a symbol he is the symbol of evil in a way even though it's technically all for one that you could consider the symbol of evil but still stain was like the symbol of evil that gave that spark back up to the entirety of you know the villain side and that's what's happening here and this was like what he said he's like you can't do things without conviction and shigaraki as a character we see as a villain he's definitely lacking okay if we go back to you know season one he was like game over he was like game over and all that and he's like let's pack up gg game over and just you know leave the place and all that because they were losing people and stuff it showed what type of person he was it showed how Shigaraki was as a person if you'd be willing to stick to what he wants or and go all the way or would he back out when the going gets tough. It's kind of like this, okay? If someone has a motive they really want, like they want something they want to achieve and go after, usually you shouldn't be so fickle because if you really want something, you shouldn't back out of it. Like if you've been training or whatever for many, many years to do whatever to get this job done and then one thing happens on the road, it's a little bump and all that and you're like, I give up. It shows that your ideals and all that were not worth anything at whatsoever. Basically, you, you your ideals were false. You, you definitely didn't believe in those ideals and you were just saying those things just to say those things. And this is very, very similar to how Stain was as a character. Let me talk about that. So as we know, Stain, the reason why he fell was because of his own ideals. His ideology is what backed him into a corner and what got him captured in the first place. It was thanks to him not giving up on his ideals. It was thanks to him never losing track of his conviction that led him to where he got defeated by Izuku, Todoroki, and Ida was because he didn't want to kill him. Because he, he saw good heroes and he didn't want to end their life, and which backed him up into a corner. So his own ideals is what trapped him. And in this case, that's kind of the example here. It's showing that no matter what, if you have a conviction or ideals, you shouldn't be able to give them up like that. You, you should stick with them and never give them up whatsoever. And that's what this episode is trying to show. When Shigaraki is thinking about Stain, and when he gained his conviction, he shouldn't be so fickle. He can't give things up that easy. And that's what he was doing in Season 1, when he was just ready to walk off and leave and all that. He's like, it's game over. That showed that he was very, very fickle and didn't have conviction. So anyways, let's talk about the big parts about this, okay, when it comes to his character. Now, he finally got his objective. He finally felt what he wants. Now, we always knew he kind of wanted to get rid of All Might. That was established in Season 1. But now with this episode, it's kind of like we get to see everything that Izuku's been going through throughout this season was all compiled in this one episode for Shigaraki. Shigaraki got this development that... Basically, it's very similar to Izuku. Izuku, he got his own ideals, his conviction. He is, you know, the reason what he wants to do and to be a hero is because he wants to be able to smile like All Might. And, you know, All Might inspired him. And I talked about this in length in last week's episode. How Bakugo, he was inspired by All Might. How Todoroki was inspired by All Might. And also how Izuku, they were inspired by different reasons and all that. And that's why they are like they are when they're trying to be a hero. And in this case, you can look at Shigaraki as someone that was also forever changed by All Might. That, that's what you could get here. Similar to how Izuku, he wants to be like All Might and be able to smile no matter what, even if he's running and looking at death in the face, he wants to be able to smile and stand up no matter the cost. That right there is very similar and it parallels with what Shigaraki wants. Shigaraki doesn't like the smiles. He doesn't like people that are smiling and having this disgusting smile, even though there's a lot of heinous stuff going on in the world. And basically, you see parallels to this of how All Might has changed Shigaraki, but also how All Might has changed Izuku. So, very similar to last week's episode, how it was showing that All Might has had such a large effect on so many people in the series, 
It's very similar to the villain side. The villain side has been affected by All Might as well. Like, let's look at Stain. Stain is a perfect example of this. Stain is someone that wouldn't be like he is if it wasn't for All Might. All Might is what kind of inspired him to see the ideal hero. All Might is the ideal hero, what everyone should inspire to be. And that's what Stain fought. That was his ideal, his ideals or ideology. And in this case... All Might inspired Stain, which in turn caused a chain reaction for, you know, the others, the new characters to join the League of Villains, but also Shigaraki to question his own motives, what he's doing, how is he different from Stain, and then realizing what he needs to do. It's all about All Might. And that right there, that is what shows what type of role All Might has played in this story. He is someone that continuously affects so many people. He is a good role model, or in some cases, his ability to be a role model can do negative things. In this case, what Shigaraki is doing right now in, you know, this episode. So, right there, I just wanted to point out All Might has had a big effect, not just on the hero side, but on the villain side. It's not just a one-sided thing, it's both sides. And like I said, Stain wouldn't be like he is if it wasn't for All Might. And then, you know, Shigaraki, he wouldn't be getting affected like he is if it wasn't thanks to Stain, which was affected by All Might. So it was like a chain reaction. And then you have the other characters joining into the League of Villains. So, like I said, just a big systematic domino effect going on because of good and evil constantly clashing and all that. So let's talk about one big thing about this that many might not have noticed. Now, like I already said, the development that Izuku's been going through, it's very similar to what Shigaraki got in this episode. Everything that, you know, Izuku got and developed and all that learning teamwork and everything, like, for instance, the last episode was focusing on Bakugo and Izuku's teamwork, that's what this episode was about. It was about Shigaraki finding his objective, his goals, but also learning how to work as a team, further his goals, and push forward to achieve what he wants. In this case, there's big parallels between the two characters, Izuku and Shigaraki. And I believe at the scene when he's walking away and all of that, you see like how he's just thinking about what's going on. He thinks about the hero killer Stain, and he's like, hero killer Stain, I am taking your conviction, your ideals, and I'm using them as a stepping stone. That was a very powerful moment, because it shows now what he wants. He now has a clear mind. He definitely knows what he wants to achieve, and he's willing to step up the stairs and just crush people under his boots to get what he wants. And he's finally learned what he needs to do to accomplish this. In this case, when he's doing that, it's very scary. Stain effectively is being used. Everything that Stain was, and his convictions... You have it where Shigaraki has now understood that he needs to use that. He has to use Stain's ideology to further his own goals, to achieve what he wants. If he wants to make a world where justice is destroyed, where there is nothing and people realize that there's no reason to smile, then he needs to use that ideology. He needs to show how messed up the hero society really is. In this case, he is using Stain's ideology for his own benefit, which is very, very usual for a villain to do like that's what they should do and like I said when he's walking away and once he's done thinking about that you see this image where Izuku's looking one way and then Shigaraki's looking another way and you see you know Izuku he's crying and all that and you see like how it's a frown and when you see Shigaraki smiling which is very symbolic in a way it's not just the fact that it was showing the parallels between these two characters and their facial expressions but it's also paralleling what was being said in the episode remember Shigaraki he doesn't like the disgusting smile of All Might or all the others around and all that. He thinks it's just awful and disgusting because they shouldn't be doing that at all. Even though there's just so many things going on in the world, they somehow can still manage to smile. It's just, it's disgusting. Justice is messed up. And he wants to show how justice is such a fragile thing. And you see in that scene, he's smiling. But Izuku, someone that actually should always smile no matter what in the face of danger, which is what the last episode was about, was frowning. So, like I said, there was a correlation there, a parallel between these two characters, and it was very symbolic, just showing how similar these two characters are, but they're on their own respective paths. Yeah, after Izuku, he's going down the path of the hero. He is becoming the greatest hero, while Shigaraki, he is becoming... The greatest villain. So, effectively, when you look at this scene, you figure out anime only will probably finally point the dots together and be like, oh, Shigaraki is a main character. Let me explain. As I've been already stating throughout this video, 
everything that Izuku's went through is what Shigaraki's basically going through, but in his own way. He's developing very similar to how Izuku is, but a little bit different because he's on the villain side. And every time you see Izuku getting development, you can kind of put this on Shigaraki. He's getting very similar development. And that's what you see happening here in this episode. And because of this you can realize that it's not just Izuku that's the main character of this story. It's actually Shigaraki. It's a story about a hero becoming the greatest hero, but also a villain becoming the greatest villain. For instance, similar to how All Might and All for One is. All Might is the symbol of peace. All for One is the symbol of evil. There you go. That is what's happening here. Two new symbols are being brought up on pillars, to be brought up for society, to shape society, and be new role models for the respective sides. That is what is happening in this episode. So, we have two main characters. It's not just Izuku, it's Shigaraki as well. So every time you see Izuku developing and figuring out what he needs to do, Shigaraki is doing something very similar in his own way. So, anyways, with that being said, let's talk about how scary his conviction is. What, what does it necessarily mean? So, we know he doesn't like All Might. He wants to kill All Might, get rid of him. But, that's very standard. When you think of a villain wanting to kill All Might, it makes sense, because All Might is the number one hero in Japan. He, you know, everybody looks up to him, he's the symbol of peace, and so it's obvious many would want to get rid of him. I mean, he's, you know, probably in prison a lot of people and all that, so obviously people would have a lot of grudges against All Might. It just makes a lot of sense. That's typical. However, that's not enough to make a really good and interesting character and a scary villain. Just because a villain wants to kill All Might doesn't automatically mean, oh, this is a scary villain, regardless, or a very good villain in terms of writing. That doesn't make a good villain. And so Shigaraki, until this very point, he was a very plain villain that didn't really have anything going for him and many might not even really have cared about his character at all because of he didn't have anything interesting really going on he looked interesting in terms of design and his voice actor was great since it's Marilyn from Hunter Hunter but also because of just his quirk but besides that he didn't really have anything going on that made him really unique as a villain and in this episode his his conviction is what is really scary he wants a world without All Might. He wants to get rid of All Might and have it to where the world realizes that justice j just can easily be blown away like it's nothing. It's it's messed up. And you could look at this and look at a lot of similarities to the Joker and how the Joker wants to cause chaos. You put people in a room and all that and they realize that only one of them can survive, they'll start trying to kill each other to be the last one standing. That's just how it is. Survival of the fittest. You know, people will easily throw away their own sense of morals and justice just to save their own selves. That's just how people are. I mean, you could say whatever you want. You could try to be morally just and say, nah, Chibi, you know, I would never do that. I would never try to save my own self, even though if I was in a room with 10 others and all that. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you can't say anything until you're in that spot. And most of the time, your survival instincts are just going to kick in. And you're going to be like, if I have to push you off a bluff, I'll push you off the bluff to save myself. That's basically how people would probably react. And that's what Shigaraki wants to expose. He wants to expose the fact that people... They will easily throw aside their false mask when things get tough, when things get really bad. They will no longer be smiling and happy. They will do things that is just absolutely despicable. In this case, he likes to talk about the law. He mentions that it's weird. It's really weird, and it's messed up how everyone in this mall, they are all smiling and happy, even though all of them have a quirk, or at least the majority of them should have a quirk, and if they're not like Izuku, like, they all have a quirk, so why can they be so happy and calm? And you don't really think about it at first. You, you don't really take a moment to factor in what he's trying to say until you really process it. They all have quirks. They could all have quirks just like Shigaraki. The ability to disintegrate someone by just putting their entire hand on someone. They get any of them. There. Anyone walking down the road could have an ability like that that's that dangerous. And for some reason, everybody is smiling. Everybody is calm. And they think that everybody will be just. Nothing bad can really happen. And that is what he wants to prove. He wants to prove that you shouldn't feel like everybody is going to follow the law and be morally right. Or act like you're so calm, even though you're around so many dangerous people. I mean, let's take for an example Todoroki. His abilities are very, very dangerous. 
his fire and ice can easily kill someone. Easily. Without even batting an eye. Could easily get rid of someone. And this is just the danger of quirks. Quirks are very, very dangerous. You don't think about it, but they can really put some harm on someone. And in this case, that's what Shigaraki was trying to say when he was talking about the law. He doesn't understand. It's sickening how everybody could just feel so happy. And that's what Shigaraki's stating. It's like he just doesn't understand how everybody could be so calm when anyone can have like a quirk as dangerous as him. And they're walking down the road and he can die like that. He just does not understand that. And that's why he wants to remove remove that happiness he wants to remove all might because if all might's removed they might not be able to smile anymore and in a way like i said izaku is falling down the path like he's going down the path of all might and so he's carrying on that will of smiling and smiling no matter what in the face of danger in this case even if all might is snuffed out Izuku would still technically be there, and it's kind of like an endless cycle that there will always be a shining light, and there will always be darkness. If there's darkness, there has to be light. If there's light, there has to be darkness, because with light comes shadow, and with a shadow, that must mean that there must be a light. And so it's two sides of the same coin, and there can never be one without the other. And that's what the episode is really trying to focus on, is that he wants to try to break the coin. He wants to get rid of of at least one side completely, or sides in general. He wants to get rid of that, which makes him very scary. So, he has like a Joker mentality. He wants to cause, he wants to cause chaos, and that's his objective. He wants to get rid of All Might and cause chaos. Will he achieve that goal? We'll have to see where it goes. So, that's enough of talking about that. I, I do want to do a quick clarification, though. Let's talk about Shigaraki's little brief uh, past flashback. So, just to remind anime onlys, there was a scene in Season 1 where his hand dropped off his face, and he said, Father. Shikardaki said, Father, when a hand fell off his face. And in this episode, you see a brief flashback, and you see a hand on the ground, blood, and you can assume it's a young Shikardaki. You could obviously piece things together. I, I think it's very obvious. I, I don't think you have to be, like, you know, a rocket scientist to realize what that possibly implies. Basically, Shigaraki, the reason why he's upset with how the world is so calm and they think everything will be fine is because he probably accidentally killed his father. See, his quirk is dangerous. If he puts all five fingers, his entire hand, on an object, it disintegrates. And so in this case, you got to imagine a young age when he's not really aware of what he's capable of or what he's doing, what type of damage he can do. Okay, so for an example... He's a baby, and he has this quirk. If he was to grab his mother or father, he would automatically activate his quirk, which then would kill him. And so that's basically what this is showcasing, is that he has never been able to control his quirk. He can't control his quirk. The only way to control it is by not putting his entire hand on something. So if he puts his entire hand on something, it disintegrates. And you gotta imagine, at a young age, he probably was unaware of what he was really doing. So he probably, when he was angry or something, he might have accidentally killed his father, put his hand on him, and killed him. And when he realized what he did, which in turn corrupted and changed him into what he is. So that right there I think is very obvious. I, I think everybody could piece that together. I mean, it's, it's really obvious if you think about Season 1 and in this episode, so it's not a spoiler or anything. It's just piecing information together from what we already seen in the anime. So... Yeah, basically, Shigaraki, he, it's implied that he probably killed his father, and that's why he's like he is, why he's so messed up, and why he has that warped viewpoint and all that, why he has that type of conviction, is because of what he did with his own actions when he was younger. So, anyways, let's talk about the other scenes. So, overall, let's talk about Toga. You know, the girl. That was at the beginning of this episode. That's going to be one of the new characters, and then you have uh, Dami. So, Dami and... Uh, you have it to where Toga, they're introduced finally in the series. I mean, they were showed already in previous episodes, but we finally really get to see some spotlight focused on them in this episode, and I was really happy with the voice actors for both characters. I'm really, really satisfied with the voice actors. I have no problem with the voice actors. I think they're perfect for the roles they're going to be playing, especially when they have more lines in Season 3. So I feel like Studio Bones couldn't have chosen better voice actors for the characters. It, it's perfect. It's straight up perfect. And 
I'm fine with that. So, n no problem whatsoever from those scenes and all that, and the voice acting, it's quality. So, final part to talk about, I guess let's talk about Ochiko. So, Ochiko, she is very messed up right now. She doesn't know how to feel about the whole, is she in love with Izuku? Now, we do know that Naval boy, he brought up like, oh, you must be in love with him or whatever, do you like Izuku? And ever since then, she's been thinking heavily about it. Now, I find this, like, very, very interesting, because in normal shonen, usually the writer doesn't like to focus on romances, unless it's a romance, like, shonen. But if it's like a battle shonen or something, like Boku no Hero Academia, usually you don't get to see romance ever having the spotlight this early in the series. I think this is around, like, chapter 70 or 80s. I, I could be wrong there about the number, but I believe this is, like, around chapter 80 or 70s when uh, this happened in the actual manga. It could be a lot earlier than that, but basically, it's very early in the manga. And usually, shonen that go for a long while, and we know Boku no Hero is probably going to go for many, many years, usually romance doesn't get focused until probably, like, the final arc or, you know, the final chapters of a series. And it's very refreshing to see that Horikoshi is kind of lining his ducks in order for, you know, the inevitable romance at the end of the series. Now, I know romance isn't the main focus of any series. It shouldn't be. And I don't think that should dictate your thoughts on the series or feelings on how you feel about the ending at all. I, I don't think ships should really control that. I, I don't. Even if, like, let's say Ochiko and Izuku don't end up together, which that's my ship, I wouldn't be upset. I, I wouldn't. I I'm, I'm not one of those people I get salty and crusty because I don't get the ship I want. I I'm not one of those people. However, I do appreciate the fact that... Horikoshi is going in depth with the romance and trying to make it make sense. It's organic. It doesn't feel like it was thrown together real quick towards the end just to please the fans. Having this slow build up with Ochiko realizing that she loves Izuku or falling in love with Izuku is very nice because in this episode it shows that she's very unaware of her own emotions. She doesn't really know if she loves him. Like she knows that there's a possibility she likes it, but she's unaware, like, why she's feeling these things, and you can see how it's slowly developing. She's thinking about this and all that, she's trying to wonder, you know, does she really like him, and it's just, it's gradually being built up, which, like I said, is very refreshing, because many shonen, they don't like to have that. They don't like to focus on that at all, so it's nice to see how this has been a big focus in, you know, the recent episode. So, I'm just very happy for Horikoshi being able to write something like this and not have to, you know, shove it until the very end of the series and have everybody getting upset, because when when that finally does happen, I think everybody will be satisfied with the relationship because there's no complaining. It was there the entire time. You can't say it was forced or rushed because it's been building up since like the very beginning of the series and that's what's happening here. So just good stuff overall when it comes to Ochiko and her scenes. So I think that's about it. I think I've gotten everything I need to discuss. Um, hmm. Have I discussed everything? Let's see. I've went really far in depth with uh, Shigaraki and how he's like another main character like he's basically the main character alongside of Izuku talked about that a lot I talked about Toga talked about Dabi talked about I think I've talked about everything so I, I, I think I have completed this video or this review the final review if I have missed anything please forgive me I am very sorry if I have but it was a good finale. Just overall, even if I missed something, it was a very good finale. It was a 10 out of 10. It sent chills up my spine. It was a quality episode. Great music, great art, animation, just all around. It was a wonderful episode. It couldn't have been any better. It really couldn't have. I mean, I just like how the tone of it shifted with, you know, Shigaraki having the focus. It was such a good episode. So, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I love you all so much. Please be safe. Chibi